Hi, I'm Thomas Alper, and this is my doctoral dissertation defense entitled A Chemical Rheological Tribological Model for Design of Siloxane Based Lubricants. It was given at Northwestern University late November 2012, and this is addressed to a fairly specialized audience, so it's kind of a high level overview of what. Uh, Conducted. I'll give a start as what exactly polysiloxane is, its molecular structure, and then we'll get a high level view of the rheological tribological model before going into the model. So, polydimethylsiloxane is one of several species of silicones or siloxanes that have been manufactured for a variety of purposes. And part of the reason I took this research was for Dow Corning Corporation to figure out new applications of some of their material stock. So some of the benefits it has is very strong intermolecular um, bonds. The silicon oxygen bond is 460 kJ versus the more common carbon-carbon bond of 348 kJ per mole. Uh, it's got long bonds, uh, 100 0.164 nanometers versus 0.1153, and low steric hindrance, which means none of the oxygen molecules are encumbered by uh, side branches, more or less, that would stiffen the molecule overall. So it's pretty flexible, and as we'll see later, it's also very slippery. It also has, or some of these properties, give it a low glass transition temperature, which means it remains liquid to very low temperatures. High oxidative stability, uh, PDMS, polydimethyl siloxane, below, uh, stable at 573 Kelvin. Phenylmethyl siloxane, 649 Kelvin. And it's got viscous thermal stability and many other properties, such as the low monomeric friction that I. So we look at several species of siloxanes. First of all, there's a, cat, a grouping of six, you could say alphabetized A through F of polydimethyl siloxane. Again, the two methyls denote dimethyl, silicon oxygen denotes siloxane, and this is one monomer of which multiple monomers may exist. In this case, the molecular weight increases, as does the viscosity, and that is due to the greater number of monomers in the higher mass samples. Just these ones with high viscosity. Then we also have polyphenylmethyl siloxane. In this case, the abbreviation is PPMS instead of PVMS. That accounts for the phenyl molecule branched onto the silicon atom shown there, along with the other methyl, methyl molecules attached to those. In this case, they are comprised of 10%, 50%, and 90% methyl branches, and then the remainder is dimethyl branches. And another type of family of siloxanes was the polycyclohexamethyl siloxanes, which look a lot like the phenylmethyl siloxanes, but in this case, they hydrogenate the um, phenyl molecule to create, create cyclohexyl. So we actually synthesized these cyclohexyl groups out of the phenylmethyl groups using catalytic hydrosylation, uh, the pressure and temperature with the catalyst shown there. In addition to those groups, there were also alkyl branch siloxanes. In this case, the A denotes alkyl. Uh, here we've got the alkyl branch. This is actually alkyl methyl in addition to the dimethyls that we saw earlier. And in these cases, we went from 8%, 30%, and 100% of the specialized branch, in this case, the alkyl methyl branch. This was produced by basically binding a alkyl group onto a hydrogen bond that was available at this silicon oxygen site shown here, again, in the presence of the catalyst. Uh, conducted by the chemistry department. In addition to these, we were able to do some pendant branched alkyl methyl siloxanes. In this case, 100% phenyl alkyl and then 30% uh, phenyl alkyl. That basically meant we had a phenyl at the end of that alkyl branch. And we also looked into 
polytrifluoropropyl siloxanes. In this case, it has a fluorine uh, molecule, a group of molecules is attached to one of the pendant branches, also shown here, not, not the actual figure. This allowed us to create a very generalized model for the four structural features present in the range of polysiloxane molecules that we looked at so far in terms of their major um, structural characteristics. So on the one hand, we looked at percent functional branch content, that is to say uh, the percent of branches that have some functional attachment associated with them in contrast to the dimethyl branch with constituting pure polydimethyl siloxane. Then in looking at the branch itself, we were curious about what the actual length of that branch was. In this case, these are all carbon-carbon bonds and the branch length was able to be ranged anywhere from eight to 12 carbons, really down to one carbon in the case of this uh, very basic methyl group shown there. We also looked at the type of branch. Was it purely alkyl? Was it purely phenyl or cyclohexyl? Was it fluoropropyl? Or was there some type of alkyl branch connecting a pendant to the edge of that molecule? We also had to consider how molecular structure affects rheological properties. In this case, two features of the geometry stood out. I should add um, the is the percent branch content, the J is the type of branch, and then the Z is the atomic length in number of silicon and oxygen atoms. So two, four, six, eight. In contrast to what's commonly referred to as degree of polymerization, where each mer of the polymer is accounted as a single unit, in this case, because of the silicon and oxygen, we count both of them in this letter Z of the characteristic structure. We also have uh, molecular mass distribution, volume structure relationships, volume pressure and temperature relationships, uh, viscosity structure, viscosity structure temperature relationships, and pressure viscosity index. In this case, you can see several structural relationships and then uh, a couple, you could say, temperature pressure relationships. I should say that this partially adds to pressure viscosity index. And then we also look at the geological tribological properties of these molecules with all their modified branch content, which manifests as film thickness, stress strain distribution, and then the combination of asperity and film friction, which gives rise to the total friction. So the objectives are to correlate the molecular structure of diverse siloxane species, dimethyl on the top, phenylmethyl on the bottom, and make some relationship to their material properties, density, viscosity, pressure viscosity index, as well as their tribological properties, such as film thickness and friction coefficient. And to identify the structural features that are most conducive to optimum tribological performance allows us to develop an optimization algorithm to optimize the structure in order to meet certain tribological applications, such as minimizing friction and wear in this Geyer interface, or minimizing wear but maximizing friction in this case, traction uh, in a tribological interface such as this uh, universal transmission. So four coordinate systems have to be used, uh, one of which relates the molecular and rheological properties of the siloxane molecules to their performance or their uh, material characteristics and flow characteristics. And the other system has to relate the rheological properties to the tribological. And while many of these are multidimensional, I stuck with two dimensions in many cases. So for structural, we've got percent branch content and length of the siloxane molecule. For thermodynamic properties of the rheological um, properties, we have pressure and temperature. And then for the tribological interface, we'll see the anything from a ball bearing to a roller bearing has different entrainment speeds and slide to roll ratios. 
And then finally, the geometric characteristics, in this case, parallel versus perpendicular to the line of flow. So, and in most instances, we've got a ball bearing, uh, which could equally be a journal bearing or needle bearing, whatever the case may be, in the direction of flow and then perpendicular to the direction of flow. So we'll start with the overview, the four structural features that I mentioned earlier, percent brand content, branch length, branch type, and polymer, backbone length. And the first set of models covers how it is that we can relate these structural features to rheological properties. This goes through a series of steps, calculating the molecular mass, the van der Waals specific volume of the molecule, the specific volume, the molecular packing factor, specific volume at atmospheric pressure as a function of structure, specific volume at various temperatures and pressures, and then um, structural features associated with the load and operating conditions, viscosity as a function of structure, QLZ, and then viscosity as a function of temperature and pressure, which is also a function of specific volume at temperature and pressure. This allows us to get important features such as the pressure viscosity index and the activation energy of the various siloxane structures. And these all have predictive models that can be combined to provide a certain output, including specific volume, specific uh, viscosity, and pressure viscosity index. These can then be input as rheological properties to provide a tribological output that we're, we're looking to optimize. In some cases, in all cases, it's minimize asperity friction because that's associated with wear. In most cases, it's minimize uh, film friction uh, because that's associated with energy loss. But in the case of tri uh, traction fluids or continuously variable transmission, this actually has to be maximized. Anyways, we'll go through a series of film thickness calculations, non-Newtonian film thickness calculations, uh, shear strain rate, shear viscosity, as well as pressure, asperity friction, non-Newtonian shear stress, average shear stress, and average pressure for the tribological interface uh, shown in non-dimensional form using the hammer dowsing equations. This then allows an output, in this case measured data, that can be compared to the theoretical data obtained by these final components shown there. And this then can be fed back to a systematic variation of parameters of the four molecular structures shown here to determine which has the optional optimum uh, friction coefficient. So I'll start with the development of the model and uh, optimization. We want to envision a tribological interface such as the point contact that occurs under a ball bearing under load, which can give rise to pressures of the order of one gigapascal. And this in turn can take a given molecular structure, such as the dimethyl siloxane shown here, and cause it to be extremely compressed into that little interface. So we need on the one hand specific volume at, com at, at atmospheric temperature and pressure, and we also want to predict how that volume will change under the extreme temperatures of the tribological interface. In addition to that, we want to be able to predict the viscosity of the molecules also as functions of structure, QLJZ, at a certain temperature and pressure, in this case, atmospheric pressure, and again, predict how that viscosity will vary, again, at the extremely high temperatures and more so pressures of a tribological interface. And on the one hand, this material has to create a thin film that will separate the two solid components of the interface, but not a film that creates excess friction losses, which represents energy loss in that interface. And from this, uh, the combination of viscosity and operating speed, we can obtain measurements for the non-Newtonian viscosity, that is to say, shear viscosity, 
as a function of shear strain rate. So the coordinates for the molecular rheological model, QLJZ, and temperature and pressure are related to structure on this side and then thermodynamic characteristics on this side. We looked at four species at reference temperatures and pressures uh, interest in the specific volume, bulk viscosity, and pressure viscosity of those properties, as well as their thermodynamic variation as functions of temperature and pressure or temperature alone in the case of a pressure viscosity index. So to start off with, the van der Waals specific volume was needed to be calculated. And this is done, it's detailed in the actual manuscript, uh, but this is done by taking the sum of the methyl groups, uh, the terminal branches on the, some of the, I should say, van der Waals volume of the methyl groups, and then whatever monomers are used to compose the actual polycyloxane. So in this case, this is a dimethyl monomer, this is an alkyl monomer, this is probably phenyl, and this is cyclohexyl, and the same corresponding terms percent uh, number of monomers of methyl, uh, alkyl, um, phenyl, and cyclohexyl. Uh, and then the molecular mass of the terminal groups associated with them as well. So that gives Van der Waals specific volume, the quotient of ordinary volume and molecular mass. And the trends that can be observed by these more or less theoretical calculations is that as alkyl branch length increases, so does the Van der Waals specific volume. Likewise, as alkyl branch length increases, so does the molecular mass. So the quotient of these two then gives a representation of the van der Waals specific volume, which will be used not only to calculate ordinary specific volume, but also viscosity. Uh, so van der Waals specific volume typically ranges in the order of 0.64 to 0.77 to the centimeter per. Now, uh, we also want to understand the difference between measured uh, van der Waals volume and occupied volume in the vicinity of molecules in the sample. So on the one hand, there is the van der Waals specific volume for the preceding slide and a molecular packing factor that has to be deduced to provide the specific volume at, uh, in this case, reference pressure of 0.1 megapascals and reference temperature of 25 Celsius, 298 Kelvin. The trends, in this case, of the, the increasing volumes associated with increasing alkyl branch length. Now, volume variation as a function of pressure and temperature can be obtained from the uh, volume, reference volume as a function of structure alone if we can solve for multiple constants in the Tate Doolittle equation shown here. Uh, so many of the details of this information is, is provided in the dissertation defense and various other papers that arose from this. But ultimately, we can use um, the equation of state to relate volume as a function of structure at a reference temperature and pressure to the volume at a range of temperatures and pressures up to, in this case, one gigapascal and 500 Kelvin, more or less, uh, using this equation of state. And here we have the actual experimental data for several measurements conducted by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, as well as the curve fit uh, using those pressures and temperatures uh, shown in the equation there. So uh, moving on from volume structure temperature relationships, uh, we want to now look into viscosity structural relationships. These are admittedly more complex than specific volume alone. So uh, here we have uh, make use of a paper by Barry and Fox, in this case, uh, 2008 manuscript that used, described viscosity as a function of a structural factor that is characterized by the length and branch content and makes use of a mean radius of gyration in addition to a monomeric friction factor. So viscosity is the function of these two variables, this um, structural factor and monomeric friction factor, the latter of which is merely constant for a given polymer species. Um, 
So in this case, again, we've got the overall polymer length, uh, in this case, corresponding to the term you described earlier. We've got specific volume, we've got molecular mass, and then we've got the radius of gyration, S squared, and then a term referred to as the ratio of radii of gyration or the branch ratio. Uh, in addition to that, then, we take this X, the structural factor, and take a function of that that relates the packing characteristics of kind of the assumed model used in this design and relates it to two constant critical lengths. I should say they're constant for a given species. And the exponent shown in this case varies as a function of whether the calculated length, using the numerator there, is greater or less than the critical length for each uh, particular molecule. Beyond that, the monomeric friction factor, the zeta term there, slightly different plots for the same Greek letter, uh, is a function then of branch content and branch length and can be obtained by exponential equations relating it to uh, various packing factors and expansivity coefficients. So total viscosity then is the product of the function of the structural factor and the monomeric friction factor shown there. And now we've got to look into the specific term, the branch ratio, that is to say the ratio of radius of gyration of branched to linear uh, polymers, really of any sort. Uh, the figures shown here kind of illustrate some of the dimensions described earlier in terms how they would manifest in pasta noodles. Uh, here we've got uh, from the axis, the central axis of the polymer to the outer edge would be the so-called branch length. The relative density of branching, uh, relatively sparse here in comparison to relatively dense here, is referred to as branching ratio. And then the overall length of the polymer would be described as this uh, number of silicon oxygen atoms analogy. But continuing on with the ratio of radii of gyration, this is a ratio of branched to unbranched uh, molecules, and it draws from graph theory, specifically the work of Weiner and Zimmern Stockbrauer, Stockmeyer, uh, it, which was encapsulated well by Bonchev in 2001. Here we have uh, the various polymer species, in our case polysiloxanes, and then the range of branches, in this case, we could say methyl, dimethyl, um, penta, um, alkyl, all of those different types. And there's several parameters in this that actually come into play. The ratio of branch to uh, side branch or segments that connect the branches, so the length of the branches to the branches inside, the number of branches, capital B here, and then the branch functionality, which is a term described in the paper. But ultimately, this allows us to say the unbranched polydimethyl siloxane in comparison to the 8%, 30%, and 100% octyl methyl siloxane. In this case, an octyl branch has eight carbon atoms in it. Uh, it shows the fairly steady decrease in the ratio of radiogyration with increasing percent branch content from 8 to 30 to 100 percent, frankly, from 0 percent right there. Beyond that, we've got the structural factor uh, that describes viscosity by molecular form. Now we've got the actual structural factor X, and that can be calculated and shown in what are vanishingly small terms, at least for the magnitude standard here with increasing branch length uh, and then branch content. The, well, this is length of the polymer itself. Now, these are actually increasing branch length. The structural factor decreases. So this was necessary to actually calculate viscosity as a function of structure using this function of structure right here. Uh, and again, the Avogadro's number, the critical structural factor, and then the variable structure factor, factor with these exponents shown in the cases right there. So the uh, function of structure doesn't look so much different from the function itself. They both more or less decrease, but you can see there's a substantial increase order of magnitudes 
but nonetheless, we see these same trends in terms of the increasing alkyl branch length, which is a specific example. So polydimethyl siloxane, polydimethyl monomers have a very low intermolecular friction. This is the Greek letter zeta. Zeta naught is used for the viscosity at atmosphere and it's 298 Kelvin. So uh, what is notable in this literature right here, we've got the polydimethyl siloxane and its monomeric friction factors shown right there. These are actually the most slippery of polymers, at least that I found in the literature. Um, beyond that, I just showed as well several of the alkyl or alkyl methyl siloxane branches that we had also synthesized in this research with their correspondingly higher monomeric friction factors. In this case, the logarithm of zeta naught uh, is, is shown for both instances, and that agrees with uh, that was used, I should say, to determine the monomeric friction range for the types of molecules used in this research. And an equation, uh, more or less slope intercept equation, was used to fit the uh, monomeric friction factor for any arbitrary species as a function of dimethyl siloxane and then the relative content, you could say, of material of that monomeric species in terms of an adaptation, we could say, of the uh, percent branch content. So this then allowed me to make a predictive model of viscosity at atmospheric pressure and temperature of 298 Kelvin, that is 25 Celsius, not only for the dimethyl siloxane, probably the, the six uh, PDMS samples I mentioned earlier, but also the alkyl and aryl branch siloxanes that had, in this case, uh, drops down to 30%, and 100% uh, branch content of octyl and dodecyl branch lengths. So I didn't really go into the naming convention established in this research, uh, but nonetheless, this is a brief naming convention kind of made more or less for my eye. Uh, beyond that, we also have for phenylmethyl siloxanes the 10% branch content, the 50% branch content, and the 90% branch content of phenylmethyl siloxane uh, in its calculated viscosity of 298 Kelvin using the method of Barry and Fox to get viscosity as a functional structure, the two factors we had seen earlier. Again, these are the six dimethyl siloxanes, which serve as the axis, you could say, of 0% specialized branch content. Uh, phenyl methyl siloxane series, just with the acronym PPMS, noting the phenyl content. So now we have to bridge all together. And uh, to do so, an established equation was readily made for the, uh, the purpose, and it's referred to as the Tate-Doolittle equation. Here, uh, we take the equation of state, uh, the Tate equation, more or less, which shows uh, data from Jacobson et al. in that ASME pressure viscosity report. And it also makes use of the occupied volume and the uh, specific volume at atmospheric pressure. Uh, so in this case, we've got volume as a function of pressure and temperature, volume as a function of structure. Then we've got viscosity as a function of structure, length and branch content. And we want to find viscosity as a function of pressure and temperature. So the Tate-Doolittle equation is essentially a combination of the Tate equation of state and the Doolittle description of viscosity variation as a function of volume changes. So we need the uh, viscosity as a function of molecular structure. And molecular structure, of course, all affects occupied volume, reference volume and variable volume, uh, which are described in this case by the Tate equation of state. And then the Doolittle equation is kind of bridged to that and used to describe viscosity as a function of pressure and pressure, where again, the ASME data and the Jacobson data are used to link these models and the specific volume and viscosity as functions of structure, temperature, and pressure. 
So uh, from this, we can calculate several useful tribal or rheological properties, such as the pressure viscosity index and the activation energy, uh, the former of which is essentially the slope of, well, the inverse integral of the uh, viscosity variation with respect to the viscosity and atmospheric pressure. And it also provides the activation energy, an indication of how quickly viscosity decreases as temperature increases. This happens to be for a particularly stable siloxane, which shows relatively minor variation over a temperature range of about 125 Celsius. So rheological properties, uh, specific volume increases with alkyl content, decreases with aryl content, expansivity, compressibility, um, decrease with aryl content. We can predict all of these properties, at least for the species that were explored in this dissertation, and viscosity increases with molecular mass, brain, branch, uh, length, and branch content. Thermal stability decreases with increased branch content, and pressure viscosity increases with those various branch contents as well. So these were the combination of theoretical and empirical equations based largely on established literature, a range of different equations used to predict viscosity uh, as functions of temperature. Now we move on to film thickness measurements, and this is a depiction of the PCS instrument's elastohydrodynamic lubrication film thickness and friction measuring device, where we sent, provided um, placed samples of our working fluids, uh, various polysiloxanes in the enclosure right there, and use the combination of a rotating disc on top, variable steel glass or steel steel, and a ball with a motor used to set the slide to roll ratio such that we can set um, various slip speeds for the travelogical interface. We were able to range from 0 to 50 newton, newtons of load, and the maximum Hertzian pressures were of the order of 1 gigapascals, depending on the material used, in this case steel for friction measurements and glass for film thickness measurements. And the test conditions actually used were a load of 20 newtons for both steel and glass, temperature uh, range shown there, speed range shown there, uh, elastodynamic Hertzian pressure, and then the friction Hertzian pressures came out as this as a function of the steel steel glass glass interface, uh, steel glass interface, and then the slide to roll ratio shown there where you be rolling for the film thickness. So the coordinates for these systems are uh, basically scaling up to another kind of higher level, we could say. Originally, the uh, molecular level is of the order of nanometers. The rheological order, considering a lot of different molecules, more or less in our equations of state, is of the micrometer order. And the actual tribological interface is characteristic of different gears. And so this, you could say, is more or less the meter order. And so two important considerations, one is the slide to roll ratio and the entrainment speed of the tribological interface. And then the other is the actual geometric dimensions of that interface, the contact region made by a ball bearing or a needle bearing uh, can vary substantially. And those can be characterized by properties. So starting with just film thickness measurements, it was quickly discovered that these uh, polysiloxanes are non-Newtonian fluids, at least for the most part. And so many of the initial film thickness measurements went substantially underneath what was predicted, at least for the Newtonian models. So fortunately, uh, Scott Baer had come up with a correction factor that uh, can be used, uh, more or less a dimensionless ratio of Newtonian to non-Newtonian film thicknesses in terms of entrainment speed, Newtonian film thickness, uh, the interface conditions, and then a shear characteristic, uh, he was able to set a correction factor that allowed us to correct for the expected um, film thickness in relation to the actual film thickness. And these were also solved in simplified form for slide to roll ratios and 
So the bare correction factor uh, was fitted to the slide to roll ratio, giving sheet speed, shear speed and slide to roll ratio shown here. We can see kind of for a new coordinate system on the one hand with 0% slide to roll ratio, we would have a certain expected film thickness from the hammer Dawson equation and then more realistic film thicknesses from the bare correction factors, which are non-Newtonian film thicknesses as the Newtonian predicted film thickness divided by the bare correction factor. This uh, shows how, how well they fit, you could say, at slide roll ratio ranges from zero, which is characteristic of free roll and ball bearings, to two, which is characteristic of pure sliding journal bearings. So the Strybeck curve is divided into three primary regions. Uh, in this case, we can measure overall friction coefficient, kind of an external measurement, but we know it's the sum of this asperity friction shown in the red line right there, and then the film friction uh, shown there. Now, asperity friction is problematic because as the little uh, figures up above show, you've got steel on steel contact or material on material, which creates debris particles in the degradation of your gearbox or your journal bearing, whatever the case may be. And the mixed lubrication range is also undesirable, but often occurs at low entrainment speeds. And then the full film lubrication regime is generally what ensures full separation of the tribological interface, but it does incur uh, hydrodynamic friction losses associated with uh, more or less the churning of fluid past it. So the distributions of asperities is a discipline or research area in its own right. There are, of course, peaks and valleys on more or less any surface. In this case, they're just kind of optimized into a hom homogenized effective sphere. And the friction itself is treated as the quotient of mean shear stress and mean load. Uh, so there's a sum, as we saw in the preceding slide, of asperity friction and film friction. Asperity friction is bad. Uh, film friction is generally bad, but not always bad. This is associated with wear, though, uh, asperity friction, and that's always to be minimized. So that can be obtained, uh, obtained as the quotient of mean shear stress of the asperities divided by mean pressure on the asperities. The film friction is the quotient of mean shear stress within the film and mean pressure of the film itself. And that mean pressure, at least for this uh, spherical contact, basically a slip ball, um, and the Hertz pressure that it gives rise to, the mean pressure happens to be two thirds of the Hertzian pressure that we saw earlier. So film friction is calculated from shear stress and shear strain rate. We can get shear rate uh, as a function or an output of the hammer dowson equation, the slide to roll ratio times the entrainment speed divided by the central film thickness. We can get shear stress from the tate doolittle equation, viscosity as a function of pressure multiplied by the shear strain rate. And we can get friction coefficient by the mean shear stress divided by the mean pressure, in this case, getting film friction. Those that you saw were able to be plotted in their own right. Now, total friction is the sum of asperity and film friction. And asperity friction was kind of idealized uh, more or less as maximum in a dry contact situation. So the maximum asperity friction was almost 0.2, that's an ordinary friction coefficient. Um, and then a kind of idealization was made, basically a model was made, that as the asperities separate, let's say that's the rough asperity on, on the surface of our uh, disk interface, as those se uh, asperities separate, eventually there's the point where no asperities contact, and so you get asperity friction of zero. On the same note, the film is becoming thicker uh, in that interface. And at some point, it begins to grow and give rise to higher and higher shear stresses and thus higher and higher film friction coefficients.
And then the uh, total friction is more or less the arithmetic sum of the two, which you can see more or less means the sum of individual points. In this case, zero plus uh, the order of 0.17 or something like that. Uh, but that gives us friction coefficients. And uh, this leads into the optimization algorithm. In this case, given the multiple dimensions present, I just took the mean asperity friction and the mean film friction and plotted them as functions of structure rather than slide to roll ratio. So this was simplification used to make a, a model that can actually be visualized. And then I also added a weighting factor to say, let's definitely minimize mean asperity friction from there. And that was used in the optimization uh, algorithm, which uh, essentially went through and tested points throughout the, uh, uh, the molecular structure shown there. It would systematically go through, generate viscosities, generate film thickness calculations, shear stress calculations, and so on and so forth and do the next uh, batch. I think I set it up as a, a 20 by 20 grid, more or less laid out to systematically locate where the mean asperity friction is lowest. In this case, you can see in the back corner at high branch content and high polymer length. Likewise, film thickness, at least in this case, happens to be looks like lowest at that back corner as well. So that would tell us the total uh, friction. In this case, we minimized at the back corner defined as we could say 180, 100% 100 branch content, um, 80 or more silicon oxygen atoms. So this is a depiction of the optimization. And ultimately there were two optimization approaches. One for the development of traction fluids is minimize asperity friction, because that always leads to wear, and then maximize film friction. And through this more or less uh, independent uh, autonomous search for these optimum conditions, the phenylmethylsiloxane and cyclohexylmethylsiloxane groups uh, kind of rose to the surface, especially with high branch content. And then in contrast, for the objectives to minimize asperity friction and minimize film friction, the alkyl methylsiloxanes and the pendant branched alkyl methylsiloxanes <coughs> rose to the surface. So kind of as a result of that, we've got elastohydrodynamic film thickness, increases with Newtonian viscosity, decreases with increasing molecular mass for non-Newtonian fluids. Uh, shear co uh, friction coefficient asperity friction increases with increasing branch content or decreases, I should say, uh, because of the thicker branches and the thicker film that separates the asperities. Uh, so on the one hand, one can create a traction fluid by minimizing asperity friction and maximizing film friction, or one can um, create a shear thinning, energy conserving fluid by minimizing asperity friction and minimizing. So the uh, lubricant, the attraction fluid as well, arose from the experimental results. In this case, we see phenylmethylsiloxanes and their very Newtonian film formation. Uh, the black lines are obtained from the high Hamrick-Gauss equation, the red, green, and blue dots for experimental measurements for film thickness. Likewise, 90% uh, phenyl, also very Newtonian, uh, in this case happens to be at slide 5. And we can cross plot that information. So on the one hand, we just saw film thickness as a function of entrainment speed. Uh, we also have friction coefficient as a function of entrainment speed. So we can essentially take these and plot friction coefficient versus film thickness because we have a common range of entrainment speed shown there. So this is just a cross that draws out the hydrodynamic friction characteristics. Here we see purely dimethylsiloxane, no specialized branches on the monomer. Uh, we also see phenylmethylsiloxane with the phenyl branches on the one uh, on 50 percent of the monomers and then we see polycyclohexylmethylsiloxane with cyclohexyl branching 
on 50% thermometers as well. And we see the steady increase in uh, hydrodynamic friction coefficient, which is desirable for a tractor. Uh, even more so, uh, the cycle hexyl branches, in this case, is just shown at uh, 300. And then in contrast to that, we saw extremely non-Newtonian behavior of the dimethyl siloxanes and the alkyl methyl siloxanes. Here we have the predicted film thicknesses with black lines and then the actual film thicknesses with red and blue lines. So these showed extreme shear threatening as a result of the very high molecular mass needed to even. Uh, some alkyl branch siloxanes, in this case 100% dodecyl branched, uh, also had a very high molecular mass and um, exhibited non Newtonian film thickness as well. But there is a certain critical film thickness, um, varies by the tribological interface, but we could say around 50 nanometers for smooth polished surfaces, where the film actually separates in the asperity minimal. So on the one hand, dimethyl siloxanes made little improvement in asperity friction over the velocity, and that is to say film thickness range uh, measured. These are again cross plots of film thickness versus viscosity and uh, friction coefficient versus, versus uh, entrainment speed. So they showed very little um, reduction in asperity friction. This area right here, we could say is large asperity friction. And then the rest of this is hydrodynamic friction. The vessel branch siloxanes showed very good reduction of asperity friction. There's negligible asperity friction here, with the exception of this when it was operating at 398 Kelvin, which is pretty high. Uh, and on the same note, there's relatively low hydrodynamic friction. It reaches a maximum at the lowest temperature and kind of decreases thereafter. Beyond that, uh, we've got our phenylmethyl siloxanes, which exhibited actually very little asperity friction, despite what the figure shows. Um, this essentially was a very thick film, so the high friction coefficient actually arises from hydrodynamic friction, not asperity friction. In contrast, again, to the lightly branched alkylmethyl siloxanes, uh, and then the more heavily branched I alkyl methyl siloxane. So this is 8%, 30%, and 100% alkyl branching, showing the steady decrease in friction coefficient, where in this range it's mostly asperity friction. But as I said, phenyl methyl siloxane makes very thick film and doesn't uh, experience friction. So some other observations can be made. Uh, molecular structure can be adjusted to these diverse applications. We can make traction fluids with high film friction or energy efficient lubricants with low film thickness friction, depending how we exercise their propensity to shear, shear thin. So um, on the left, I could say the fennel branch exhibits Newtonian uh, Characteristics, and then on the right, the alpha branch exhibits non-Newtonian characteristics. Results: I developed a set of models, many of which were borrowed from the literature, uh, the Fox and uh, Barry and Fox equation, Tate equation, um, just standard calculations of activation energy and uh, structural interface, as well as viscosity equation from. Um, from Barry and Fox, from Tate Doolittle, and uh, then the standard isoviscous pressure viscosity coefficient and its variation with temperature could all be calculated for use in a rheological model. And then the corresponding tribological model made use of the uh, hammock dawson equation, the Bayer correction factor, standard calculations for shear stress, shear strain rate, um, and hertz contact pressure and then uh, similar calculations or resulting calculations for uh, asperity friction, film friction, and total friction. These were then combined uh, into 
calculate the, well, really to separate the individual contributions to total friction, minimizing asperity friction, and then taking high or low on film friction, depending on what was needed. And then the input structural parameters were varied from like zero to 100%. I think this was found from zero to 20 branches, uh, various brand, uh, pendant types, and then elk, uh, branch length, I think, was from zero to uh, 2,000 or something like that. Um, those were varied to determine the optimum combinations of asperity and film. So it can be observed that linear, linear and branched structures on siloxanes or molecules in general affect performance. Henschel and Chiatoni had shown this in their heavily branched molecule comparisons of hydrodynamic friction to branch content. So their work illustrated that ring branch content, Q sub R, correlates to hydrodynamic friction coefficient. Uh, likewise, Gunsel had demonstrated there's a strong correlation between hydrodynamic friction coefficient and pressure viscosity index. And then finally, Jacobson had illustrated that there's a positive correlation between ring content, again, Q sub R, and pressure viscosity index. So ultimately, what this research does is says these three tribological, well, we could say this is a structural characteristic. Um, this is a material property, so we could say rheological. And then this is a tribological property, um, hydrodynamic friction. And this is ultimately a bridge between those, not only just general trends that they increase or correlate to each other overall, but an actual molecular rheological model to bridge them. So ring branch content uh, illustrates, exhibits, we could say, Newtonian flow, uh, very uh, close relationship between the theoretical and experimental lines shown there. Uh, meanwhile, linear branch content, such as pure dimethylsiloxane or alkyl methylsiloxane, exhibits very non-Newtonian characteristics, as shown by the departures, the shear thinning of the films as they move through that interface. Elastral hydrodynamic friction increases with phenyl and cyclohexyl branch content. As I mentioned, this is all predominantly hydrodynamic friction, as opposed to uh, perhaps in this region is some asperity friction, and uh, even and these other conditions at high temperatures versus modest temperatures, there is a greater preponderance of asperity friction in these lower phenyl content samples as opposed to PDM. And then several alkyl methyl siloxanes uh, were also designed to minimize uh, asperity friction. In this case, we can say a 30% dodecyl branch siloxane and a 100% dodecyl branch siloxane had comparable performances, but certainly the 100% dodecyl branch has lower asperity friction and lower hydrodynamic friction. Uh, my name is Thomas Alper. This was uh, the uh, final dissertation defense for my PhD at Northwestern University. I want to thank my academic advisor, Professor Jane Wong, a tremendous help throughout the research process. My industry advisor, Dr. Manfred Jung of Dow Corning Corporation. My uh, chemistry advisor, Professor Tobin Marks, who was in charge of all the uh, postdocs who synthesized the various siloxanes needed and gave me useful advice on patenting and experiment processes. Professor Yipwa Chung who oversaw the material science aspect of this work and gave me excellent advice on research, analytical methods, and publication. Finally, several of my colleagues, Dr. John Ling, uh, uh, Afif Sayam, Chang Wei Chen, Ji Li, uh, for their help in various phases of the research, and likewise the Dow Corning colleagues of Manfred Young, and I guess Andre Stammer, Herbert Stobauer, Stobauer and um, Michael Schwetz, in addition to Drs. Alan Mayer and John Lynn and Keith Weiss, who did the patent preparation and advising for the process. Thank you for sticking out this presentation.